So today we will take a look at time series data, microarray data, and determine how we can use persistent homology uh, to find uh, gene expressions that have a particular period. But first, I was a little sloppy with notation on Monday with respect to stability of persistent diagrams, and that will come in handy later. So just to clarify, if we want to take a look at a function going from some topological space into the real numbers, we can then take a look at sub-level sets, determine if they are connected. So here we've got two components. So we've got two components right here. And as we increase, we might create a third component, kill it, third component, kill it off, kill off one of the other components. So kill this component off as we continue increasing. And so as we increasing R, we can take a look at H0, which is this, the number of connected components we have in our pre-image of uh, points that go to values that are less than little r. And that gives us a pairing between our minimums and maximums. So that gives us the persistent B1, D1 that we can plot in our persistent diagram. And then we also have minimum B2 matching up with maximum D2, which we can then plot here. In this case, we do have one component always, and so it has infinite persistence, so we don't plot that in the persistent diagram. Any questions? We then took a look at distances between our persistent diagrams right here. Uh, one was our bottleneck distance, and basically what we want it to be true in terms of our persistent diagrams is if we have a map between our two persistent diagrams where we also included the diagonal, so this point gets mapped to this point, this point gets mapped to that point, that we can then talk about the distance between, say, our blue points and our pink points. Uh, the image of a blue point giving us a pink point or a point along the diagonal can take a look at this distance, take the soup, so the largest one of each of these, and then take the infimum over all bijections. And the nice thing about this bottleneck distance is if we have two functions, so we've got our pink function f from x into r, so here's x and here is r, and then we've got a green, a blue function from X. So we've got a pink and a blue function. We can see that the pink and the blue are very close to each other, so we would like the bottleneck distance between their persistent diagrams to be small as well. And that's what the stability theorem gives us, that if we have two persistent diagrams such that the functions that they come from are small, so if f of x is close to g of x for all x, then we also get the bottleneck distance from the persistent, for the persistent diagrams uh, is also going to be small. We could have instead done a Wasserstein distance. That way we didn't just deal with the soup of the distances, so this gives us a little bit more information. We don't just, it isn't dominated by just one thing that's farther away, uh, but all of the points uh, play a bigger role here, play a role here. Um, and we also have a stability theorem for that. It just has a few more hypotheses. Any questions? Okay. So now we wanted to take a look at a comparison of pattern detection methods in microarray time series of the segmentation clock. So you can see that from this uh, PLOS One paper, as well as section 9.1 in Edels, Bruner, and Harrow's a computational topology. So the goal basically is to determine what genes are involved in a particular periodic pathway. So there are some genes that when you plot the expression across time, their concentration will just increase and increase, and then after a while maybe it'll decrease, but that pretty much you know does it. But there are other genes that will oscillate 
with a particular time. So they will have this nice oscillation where it does basically the same thing. Uh, this is t supposed to be a function, so imagine I'm drawing a function he here. Um, so it should be some sort of thing where and our gene expression is all above zero. But there are many genes that are involved in particular periodic pathways. So maybe at the start of the pathway, you might have low gene expression increasing. And then at the next start of the pathway, it repeats itself. Or you might at the start of the pathway have high gene expression, but then it might decrease. So back to high, decrease again, so nice periodic development. The particular application that we will focus on today is the segmentation clock of mouse embryos. In particular, uh, we'll look at somite development. One somite develops about every two hours. So we know that the period equals to two. Somite development, by the way, somites are precursors of, uh, of, of vertebrates. And so we're basically uh, building the backbone one somite at a time, and that's the pre precursor for the, the vertebrate, vertebrate things, bones here. We want to know what genes are involved in the somite development. And one place to look is, well, if the period is 2, so if the period is 2, well, then that's a good indication that since it has the same period as a somite development, that it could be involved in somite development. So we would want to find the genes of period two. That would give us all the possibilities involved in the somite development, which could then be uh, checked biologically uh, doing some experiments to see if it really is involved in somite development. Uh, by the way, whenever I use the term all, I realize I used, you know, all, everything. Uh, whenever one speaks biologically, uh, everything rarely means absolutely everything. There's usually exceptions in biology to about everything. But we would expect if a gene is involved in somite development, that would have a period of the same thing as the somite development. Any questions up through here? So for persistence, because this thing is periodic, we take a look at, you know, maybe we're at time 0, time 0 0.5, time 1, 1 1.5, time 2. And so it would be, you know, periodic. We, we expect to get the same values. You know, if we plot this thing for, you know, between 0 and 2, 2 and 4, we'd be expecting if, if our gene has the period 2, that it will do the same thing uh, in both of these things. I should be trying to draw fairly smooth functions because basically your DNA gets transcribed into RNA, which then gets transcribed into protein. In these microarrays, we're checking gene expression. Well, gene gets expressed into RNA, and so it's the RNA concentration that we are checking. Well, RNA doesn't just immediately appear, so I should be having, you know, this more gradual increase here. I should have a more gradual increase, um, as well as a decrease as well. DNA, RNA, RNA will degrade, and there are proteins that will degrade RNA. There are actions that will degrade your RNA either more quickly or maybe it'll just degrade slowly, more naturally. But in either case, when we think about modeling the expression of RNA, a smooth function should be a good approximation because you do have to build up the RNA from DNA transcription and then the RNA has to degrade. Um, and so we imagine it is a is a smooth function. So we, since if it's doing the same thing for every period, we might as well make our domain S1. That way, when we send it into R1, so let me clear off my thing again. 
So when, since it's doing the same thing each time, then when I'm at time zero or time two or time four, then it should be mapping to pretty much the same point uh, in R. And so thus we can collapse R, you know, first period, second period, to all live on the circle. And then our function, we've got actually more than 7,500 genes. So we will have a function for every single gene. If we focus on one function, what we want to know is that at time point i, what's the amount of RNA at time point i for this particular gene k? So we would, if this is our time point uh, half an hour, how much RNA do we have? If we're at one hour, how much RNA do we have? If we're, you know, et cetera, as we travel along here, we basically want to know where we are in terms of the amount of RNA. Questions on that? So this is uh, an example for the gene expression pattern of axon 2. Uh, our function fk is going to be modified quite a bit. We will talk about how it will be modified. Uh, it will, for example, be normalized to live between 0 and 1. So we'll assume all the modifications have been made. And this is now our, our function that is uh, related to the expression pattern of axon 2. So we can see here the expression is pretty high. Down here the expression is pretty low. We now want to go ahead and determine our persistent diagram. So we want to go ahead and create the persistent diagram. And remember our function uh, g goes from S1 into the reals. So we can see that at time, you know, that Remember, for our persistent diagrams, as we're doing these sublevel sets, we take a look at how many components. Here we've got a component associated to minimum B3, a component associated to minimum B2, and a component associated to the minimum B0. We also have a minimum B1, but at this particular time, our B1 component got swallowed up by our B0 component. So we've got three different components. And as we change the time, we will change the number of components. And as long as we pair our minimums up with the maximum, that kills it. So the minimum means is where a new component enters. So a new component enters at this time. But then when we get a maximum, one of the component dies. And in this particular case, it would be the B1 component that would die at time D1. So we would plot in our persistent diagram. So for this pair, we would plot B1, D1. Another one that's fairly easy to see is that our B3, so this is also a minimum, as I increase the time, you know, put it up here a little bit, we will swallow up here. And so we can see that this gives us the plot B3, D3. B2 is a little bit more interesting. So why is B2 a little bit more interesting? Well, remember, we are working over S1. So this right here is S1. And this was R. But here, this is supposed to represent S1, which means that this point here is joined to that point here. It's just a little bit hard to show graphs. You know, when our function goes from S1 into R, it's hard to show this three dimension. Well, it's a, this graph, we could see it in three dimensions where we, you know, draw the S1 draw the R component and see how this thing travels around. But it's just easier to see it in the plane. Uh, and so in the plane, we can see that this point just has to be glued to that point. So thus, as we increase our time, if we continue to increase our time, 
and throw more things in so that we throw D2 in. Well, at this point, we actually uh, only have one component. So we only have the one component because this component right here might seem to end here, but if I travel along here, this point jo is joined to this. So this is a single component right here. So we also have the point B2, D2 that at before, you know, you know, approximately at this area, we had two components. We had this component, sorry, we had, yeah, before we had, say maybe at this time, we had this component and that component, but once we go up to here, then we've joined, so once we add this, we'll have joined this component to this component with this right here. So now we actually have a single component. We can continue increasing our time. When we continue increasing our time, we now join up. Oh, notice I called this thing B4. Remember, we had one component. We can't go from one component to zero components. We have an object. And so at this stage, when we join this thing up, this now becomes an entire circle. Since this point is joined up to this point, we now actually have an entire circle. So I called it B4 because we've just created something in H1. We've just created a one-dimensional cycle. And so now we have a one-dimensional cycle here instead. So in terms of plotting for our H0, for H0, we would have we would plot B1, D1, B2, D2, and B3, D3. Any questions about that? Okay. So let's first, before we go more over the mathematics, let's talk first about where the data came from. The data came from this uh, science paper that was published in 2006 on complex oscillating network of signaling genes underlies the mouse segmentation clock. And this is uh, how they describe the uh, stuff. I'll give you a chance to read it over because I'm sure the first reading will make perfect sense. Uh, the best advice I was given as an undergraduate was in my freshman biology class. And that was, if you don't understand a paper, just keep reading it, eventually you will. So this does make sense, but uh, let's parse it a little bit. They basically collected samples from 40 mouse embryos. Uh, and they used that as a proxy to collect 17 samples covering an entire oscillation cycle. So if we call this one cycle, they basically tried to get 17 points. They may or may not have been equally spaced. I probably haven't counted 17, but 17 points someplace along the entire oscillation cycle. And they actually had 40 data points, but they only chose 17 of the samples. One of the reasons for this, if we take a look at the uh, next step here, is you can imagine uh, this kind of experiment is not so easy to do. You want to probe uh, RNA expression uh, in uh, mouse embryos. Uh, in order to do that, they basically remove the embryo from the uterus and dissect it, which means once you've done a probe, you can't use that embryo anymore. Uh, you've very much inter interrupted its life cycle when you remove it from, a, from the embryo and dissect it. So thus, we have to use a different embryo for each different sample. But getting the timing, you know, not all these 40 embryos are growing at exactly the same time, so knowing when to do the dissection and pull it, you don't really know, and so thus they had to pull more embryos than they actually needed in order to get something that would cover uh, the oscillation cycle nicely. Um, 
they did actually sample from five uh, from five consecutive sunlight cycles. So I don't think they said exactly where on this thing was, but you can see that from 19 to 23, uh, that the embryos contain from 19 to 23 uh, somites. Ah, uh, yes, so that is the 19 to 23. So when they did one dissection, they found you had 19. And so if you take a look at the time, you know, our first period, our second period, dot, 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 they found one when we were, we were at the 19th period. And then they did another mouse, and maybe they found 23 somites. Uh, let's make that 22. Maybe they found 22 somites. And so then they were taking a look at uh, the RNA expression for that particular cycle someplace along here. So it might would have been someplace along here. And so they went ahead and for each of these uh, between 19 and 23, uh, somewhere along here, they did, took different samples. That actually can be useful information because if you do, for example, have a gene that just keeps getting expressed and never degraded, it will be nice and linear. And so you'll be taking points, well, not necessarily linear, but let's just assume linear. It will be increasing. So it'll be something increasing, so draw any increasing function that you want. So that would be, and this would be over our, uh, you know, between time points 19 and 23. Well, when we then plot this using our circle, I didn't use enough white space, but I think you can still see this. When we plot this using our circle, if I'm you know, going into R, so we do this sort of plot now on our circle. Let me erase all the ink on the slide. Uh, and so now if this is S1, and this is R before I was doing five of these. But remember, what we're doing is we're wrapping around. So this one would be plotted. So if we had some data points here, this one would be plotted saying increasing, you know, some data points for my S1. So I'd be having that. And then we would then do our next one. We'd be doing this kind of thing. You know, oops, sorry, this should have started above here. And so our data points would look something, you know, the timing wouldn't all be identical, but our data points would be something like this in terms of choosing these points as they're increasing, because this is the same cycle, this is the same cycle, so they're all plotted on the same S1. Does that make sense? Any questions there? In order to determine what time, whether you're at this point or whether you're at this point, so we can see how many somites, you know, the dissection, you can count the number of somites, but whether we're here in the period or whether here in the period, you can use this gene right here. They know that that has the, you know, is involved in this and has uh, the, the nice two, approximately two hour cycle. And so they can see where this expression is. So basically, they will do the RNA expression. This is the right side. This is the left side. They'll do the RNA expression on this. But then they will do uh, check for that uh, uh, lunatic fringe gene. This is the lunatic lunatic fringe lunatic fringe gene. Um, so we'll check that expression on the left side and use the expression of that particular gene on the left side to determine where at what time point. So the left side is used to order the 17. So these are 17 different mouse embryos. Some of them are at different time points. So uh, this might be in the 19th cycle. This might be in the 23rd cycle, 19th, 21st. I'm making those numbers up, but they're in different cycles. But we know that within 
a single cycle, this is the first, second, third, once we collapse them all. So we've got our, you know, one cycle, second cycle, third cycle, and we just order them going around our S1. And so ordering those things, they now have the 17 data points. Questions on that? Glad I'm a mathematician and not a biologist. Okay, so you can get all of this data. You don't have to get your hands dirty. You just can go to a, the Array Express website, enter in that accession number, put it right here, and out will pop up. The next website will be this one right here, and it will tell you the organism, get detailed sample information and links to data, uh, tells you about the what gene chips were used, uh, protocol information, a description, so it gives you a lot of good information. If we then click on the detailed sample information and links to data, you can download the data in either raw form or in processed form. The data for the 17 time points are listed here, embryo 7 through 17, dividing the, that period into 17 pieces. These first here six are controls. Controls are generally quite important in biology, uh, so one can take a look at the controls as well as the 17 time points, the microarray data expression. For, so back to our persistence, we now have for each of the more than 7,000 genes, we create this function as we briefly mentioned before, using that at time point i, the amount of RNA is our output. So we have a function from S1 that matches with our period of two hours, divided up into 17 time points to match our approximately two hour period, that then maps into the real line giving the expression at the various different time points. But there is one thing, we don't actually know exactly where the time points are, so it could be that maybe, you know, when you're doing these experiments, you don't have a lot of control. So it's possible that they, they did sample you know, from the entire two-hour period, but maybe some of the sampling points are very close, and maybe some of them are a little bit further away. So there are 17 time points, but exactly where they are, you know, it's an approximation. But if we're just trying to determine something that's periodic, if I take something that is periodic like this, and say my, you know, time points are here, and then this one was longer. Well, if I make them equal, that means I'll stretch out this thing, so I'll stretch this one out, and then we'll compress this one, so this one will be shorter, but I'm still going to get something periodic. So even if you stretch some intervals, compress other intervals, we'll still be able to determine periodic. All we care about is periodic, so we will assume all the data points are equally spaced. So we divide the circle into 17, you know, equally spaced intervals. So that's one modification. So modifying the domain a little bit, stretching things out a bit. The other modification is that instead of actually using the amount of RNA present at time point I, so instead of using the, the expression amount at time point i, they used the ranked order of the expression. So suppose we only have five time points. In reality, we're supposed to have 17, but suppose we have five time points, and these correspond to the expression levels. Well, instead of using the expression levels, we'll say, well, this is the lowest expression level, so we'll give that a 1, next lowest, two, next lowest, three, penultimate low, highest, four, highest, five. And so we'll do a ranked order going from lowest to highest. So 
our interval that's of length 17, or our point of length 17 for each of our 17 time points, we'll actually, instead of doing the expression levels, we'll instead output the numbers somewhere between 1 to 17. So we'll get a permutation of the numbers from 1 to 17. So thus, we had a function f from s1 into r, but now we're changing this thing, actually fk, one for each, so one for each gene, a function for each gene, from s1 into the numbers 1 through 17 where the value is at time point i, so if I'm at, you know, 2 pi over 17, someplace around there, we can map it to the rank, so some number, say, maybe it's the third highest uh, intensity, so we replace the RNA intensity with the rank order. So we now have that this is a number somewhere between 1 to 17, giving us the, is it a low intensity, is it a high intensity, is it someplace in the middle? Any questions about this quantity? Well, we like things starting off at zero, so we'll subtract off one. So now we've got some number somewhere between zero and 16. And we generally like to normalize so that things are somewhere between zero and one. So divide through by 16. And so this is your actual function on the various time points. So we know that at time point 1, we'll get some number. You know, at time point 1, we'll get some number out here. At time point 2, we'll get some other number, higher or lower, depending upon whether the intensity is higher and lower. But all normalized to be values between 0 and 1. Now, in actuality, though, I've only told you what to do at the time points. I haven't said what to do on the entire S1. Uh, I like drawing S1 like this because it's just easier. We just say that this point is equivalent to this point over here. So this is my S1. Over here, I have uh, R, where the maximum is now 0 to 1. So we'll have numbers somewhere between... Uh, 0 and 16 divided through by 16. So maybe it's 1 over 16, 3 over 16. Uh, this should be 0, and this should be 1. 16 over 16, 5 over 16. So we can have a number of different points. But we now want to de decide what happens between our time points. And the easiest thing to do, we don't actually care what function, because what we really only care about is the minimums and the maximums. We just care about the birth chart, you know, when things are born and when things die. So as long as we know where the minimums and maximums are, any function that preserves that is fine. So a nice piecewise linear. So just connect all your points with lines. That will work. So any function where we're really just caring about these 17 points, any function will do um, as long as we don't change what's our minimum and what's our lo local minimums and local maximums. Any questions there? And we do have, I left off the subscript, this is, we do have one of these functions for every single gene K. Any questions? So this is an example of the function for accent 2, so whatever k gives us the expression pattern for accent 2, and we can then see the birth times, the death times, in terms of their persistent diagrams. Do remember that this thing, you know, our function does go from, so this is S1, this is R, going between 0 and 1. Being S1, this point is identified with this point. So once we start joining things up, so if we, you know, have 
take a look at this sublevel set, which includes almost everything. We now have one connected component if we have this sublevel set, since this point is identical to that point. So one component. But we have now when I increase my sublevel set, we get our S1 on our first homology. So in other words, the B0 and the B4 are very different. Everything else pairs. B1 will pair with, you know, that this minimum will be corresponding to a maximum, and this minimum will create a component. This maximum will kill that component. And that's true for almost all of these. You know, B2 creates, D2 destroys the component created by B2. But when it comes to our B0 and B4, we had one component. You know, we had one component up to here. So that is very different. Our B0 and our B4, our B0 is thus our infinite component, our infinite component in H0 corresponding to B0. Our B4 is actually when we create our first cycle, and so that becomes, we continue increasing, you know, we don't change anything. So that's our function G, and the persistent diagram associated to it means that we would go ahead and plot all our, um, in our persistent diagrams, we would plot all the ones with finite persistence, so our B1, D1, our B2, D2, and our B3, D3, but we don't plot B0 infinity, and we don't plot the generator of H1. Questions there? Well, remember, we want to determine genes that have the same period as a somite development. So we want to, you know, our goal, remember, was to identify genes whose expression is periodic with a specific period. We're looking for a period of approximately two hours. That means if we've got a gene whose expression maybe starts out high but decreases continuously. That's not periodic. This one here, we've got one, two, three. You know, it's about period three. We don't want period three. We want period two. So we want to be able to distinguish between things that are not period two and things that are period two. So let's first take a look at two examples of things that are not period two one being this decrease in, uh, in expression, and this other one being periodic, but with period of about three. Well, remember, in our time course, they actually did five different. So this right here is two hours. This is two hours. This is two hours. They took their data and collapsed it from five periods. If it were period two, you would just be repeating the same data over and over again. But if we are period, you know, three or something else, then it will not quite, you know, agree with. So if you've got period two, we now want to note that we are going to say this is one cycle, this is one cycle, this is one cycle. We want to collapse all of those. And so the map that we're looking at is we've collapsed all these points. And so when we were to take a look at the function, um, uh, this is a little bit too collapsed. With the 17 data points, let me draw my 17 marks equally spaced. OK, it got a little crunched here. I should have expanded it out. But my function would do something like maybe this one's first. This would be maybe that something, you know, that would be pretty messy, uh, trying to connect the points, each of the 17 points together. They are actually equally spaced as, you know, these are uh, 
these are equally spaced, but uh, a little bit too compressed to see how to draw which one comes before which. Uh, so whether this one comes first and we go down here, I'm not exactly sure. But you can see that if it's not period two, when we start connecting these things, we're going to get quite a bit of a mess. So things that are not period two are going to look a bit messy with lots of, you know, lots of ups and downs, lots of ups and downs. And when we go up and down, it's a pretty big, you know, when I take a look at my BI and my DI, DI minus BI is large for some of the values. And that's actually an important thing that we'll be using, that if it's not period two, we will likely see that we've got a DI minus BI being pretty large. So what does period two look like? Well, what's a nice period two thing? How about our nice sine curve? Well, with our sine curve, remember we're on S1. This is supposed to be S1, so this matches up to this. And this is now my two-hour period. It's quite possible that, you know, in the first period, maybe we picked up these points. And then maybe in the second period, we picked up, you know, these points. And in the third period, maybe picked up that, et cetera. But eventually, it should fill out something that looks pretty periodic. One of the things to note about this is we have a B naught. You know, when we now do our persistent diagram on this, if I do my sublevel set, start growing my sublevel set, now start growing my sublevel set, I have one component since this point is equivalent is matched up to this. This is a single component. So at all times I just have my B naught component. But it's just one component, and eventually it closes up. But that's my B1, which is my creator of H1, because now, since this point's equivalent to this, we now have a cycle. And so instead, we have this thing going off towards infinity. This is basically the type of thing that we will assume the period two genes look like. They don't have to look like this. Our period two gene could look like something that, you know, might do something, you know, a little more interesting, or maybe it will do something, you know, but it will repeat this over and over again. So maybe it does something, you know, and it repeats it over and over again. So the period two could do other things. But we are going to assume that our period two looks pretty much where it has a single max, a single min, and that's pretty much it. How it does that, you know, whether it, you know, comes up to the maximum quickly and then stays low and then starts coming up, you know, how that does that, as long as it gets repeated. Um, we're expecting our data points to be something like this. Now, in terms of uh, our data points, they are likely noisy, so we could easily have something that does something like that. So there might be a little bit of noise in the data. So we might have more than one max and min. But if I take a look at this BI, it gets killed very soon. And so my di minus, minus my bi will be small. So basically the assumption, and this may not hold true for all the periodic two genes, but one uses a variety of different methods to catch different you know, genes that have different properties. Our assumption is basically that our di minus bi is small for all i greater than or equal to 1. And then we also have our b naught right here. 
so we don't calculate our B naught and haven't even called this one D naught because it doesn't kill off this B naught. So we're only taking a look at our DI minus BI and our assumption is that if this is small, then that will imply period two. Okay. The mathematicians don't really believe it. The biologists don't really believe it. But what we're trying to do is get potential genes. So we're just trying to figure out genes that might correlate with the somite development and have the same period. So we may be wrong for some of them, but unfortunately all the techniques that currently exist are wrong for a number of these things. They aren't all right. That is just the way life is. Uh, we don't expect to find everything. So yeah, sometimes this direction, it might be small, but not period two. Uh, we can eliminate the things for which there really isn't no any maximum or minimum. That could be you know, eliminated um, if there's no change in your expression. But there could be some things that maybe it's not period two, even though it even though the, the difference is small. Most of the time, we'd expect, you know, that if this thing is small, we would expect it to be period two, because otherwise, you have this sort of mess here where things are. You've got all these points. Since they're not period two, they get put in some, you know, a variety of different spots. You expect di minus bi to be large. But it's not a guarantee that it's period two, but we expect in many cases. The fact, in terms of going other direction, well, we can draw counterexamples where this thing is not small. You know, maybe we have something that ha has period one uh, or something that maybe it has period two, but it does this kind of thing. You know, it might be period two, but it might have something that does come down, just not as much. So that we're, there are certainly mathematical counterexamples. Are there biological counterexamples? Uh, maybe this would not pick up this period. So it would not pick up something that's period two, but where di minus bi is large, i.e. not small. So what measurement is used to detect this period two? Well, this is the measurement that we use. Notice we're summing from i equals to 1, not i equals to 0. So when we take a look at our standard sort of curve with my b naught, that is not part of the sum. We start off with i equals to 2. And then we just do our di minus bi. There's a reason to raise it to the qth power, so we'll look at many different functions. So q could be 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. So we could, you know, put it into a number of different uh, choices for our Q. Uh, but um, this is our basic function that we take a look at. If DI minus BI is small, so if DI minus BI is small, then our phi to the Q will be small. And thus, we say, that it might be period two. So this is a candidate, a candidate for being a function, candidate for being a periodic two function. Any questions up to there? And if di minus bi is large, large, then we're going to claim not period two. It could still be, but we will not look at those genes. We'll only look at the ones where this thing is small. Any questions up to here? Well, we do have a nice stability theorem. So remember in terms of our, we would like that if two functions are close together, remember this is the soup over all points in your domain of f of x minus g of x, absolute value. So if f of x is close to g of x, then we would like that 
this thing to be close. So we would like phi q of f minus phi q of g to also be small. After all, our data is likely noisy. So if I perturb f slightly and create a function g, then I would like, you know, this value to be close to this value. So if this is small, implying period 2, I'd like this to be small. If this is large, I would like this to be large if we just perturb it a little bit so that this soup is large. Sorry, so that this soup is small. Well, we have a stability theorem for t this total persistence. This is just some constant uh, for a fixed Q. It is some constant, so if this is very small, then some constant times a small number is still small. And so we do get that even if we change our function a little bit, we'll still get the same result. I don't want something that if I change my function slightly, that all of a sudden it becomes that it was periodic, but now after the slight change, it's not periodic or vice versa. And so these stability theorems are quite important. Otherwise, the results would not be valid. If you can do a slight perturbation, you know, add a little bit of noise, and now come up with a different result, that would be bad. But the stability theorem says that if we perturb it slightly, then our function values that indicate the periodicity uh, will not have changed much. Any questions up through there? Okay. So now let's take a look at this for q equals to 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. What this is doing is up here is there are 27 genes that have been confirmed to be periodic. If we now take a look at the one that looks most like it's period 2, one that kind of looks period 2, so basically what we're doing is we're looking at increasing uh, phi q, so we're looking at phi of q sort of increasing here. The larger phi q is, the less periodic we think, believe our function is. The smaller it is, the more periodic we expect it to be. Over here is the percent of the 27 genes that are that are found up into this list. So if I take a look at, you know, between here, we find one of those genes when Q is zero. If we are in this region, we might be finding two of the genes. Versus if we take Q equals to one, you know, we start finding a whole lot more of the genes. Two, three, and four, there's not much difference between them. So the two, you know, we start finding most of the genes. So if this is, so up to here, it does go up to 90%. So we found up to half the genes if we take a look at the top ranked uh, genes right here. And I forget the cutoff for this one. I think this one might be the top 150 genes. So this is a ranking of the top 150 genes. So, it's at, so it is increasing phi of Q, but it's the top 100 listed by gene. So the first gene that um, is most likely periodic, the second gene that's also very likely periodic, the third gene, et cetera, uh, actually, it's put 150 hatch marks on here, and, and it'll be quite close. So this is a little bit too close. So we might have had to have a few more genes right here. So maybe of the first you know, five genes, one of them turned out to be uh, among this 27. The 2, 3, and 4 is basically what we're interested. This is you know, almost pretty much random. I, um, go up to uh, 150 genes, and maybe I find, you know, some half of the 27. Um, that's not very good. But the main reason for the 2, 3, and 4, we're interested in particular the 2. So Q 
equals to 2 is what we'll be interested in simply because in terms of our stability theorem, in terms of our stability theorem, it's stable as long as Q is greater than or equal to 2. If Q equals to 1 or Q equals to 0, then I do a slight perturbation, uh, then uh, things will, you know, perturb a lot. So it, for Q equals to 0, for example, you know, I might have my, you know, my DI minus BI to the 0 will either equal to 1 if DI does not equal to BI, and it'll be 0 if DI equals to BI, or if I, if I don't have any, if my, I don't have DI equals to BI, I might not have a sum whatsoever. So if I don't have, if I don't have any maximum or minimums, then, you know, if, if my n is equal to zero and I have this nice periodic function, then my phi q of f equals to zero. And otherwise, I'm adding up one for each time I have a minimum and a maximum. I do a slight perturbation. I've now changed my function. So for q equals to zero, it's easy to see that it is not at all stable. Two functions that are close to each other, I'm counting the number of maximums I have or the number of minimums with this function when q is 0. q equals to 1 is also not stable. You can find functions that are close to each other, but for where this is not small. So we really need to look at q greater than or equal to 2. And well, with q greater than or equal to 2, 3, or 4, there isn't mu that much difference in terms of finding things. So they focus mostly on q equals to 2, but they could have just as easily done q equals to 3 or 4. Questions up through here. Now let's compare the five different methods. So these are the five different methods. We're again looking at the percent of benchmark genes identified. And in this case, the benchmark genes were 7 for this first graph. In the second graph, it's the same 27 we looked on the previous slide. The 27 were what was found by this L method. So this L method found 27 genes, which were then confirmed biologically. And these 27 genes, there is what's used to find here. And so thus, L found them all. So we could have done L, but L would have been, you know, 100% because that was the method that we're benchmarking against. We're benchmarking against method L. The seven were uh, known previously. They're clear. Everybody knew about the seven. Um, and now we want to compare the, the old method with the four new methods. Well, you might think P stands for persistence. But we're interested in stable persistence. And so it's our S, the gray curve, that we're looking at. And if you look at the gray curve, in the, if we rank them to the ones that we believe are mostly periodic, to the ones that we don't think are periodic, if we take a look at the top 300 genes, remember we had oh, uh, 7,549 genes. If we take a look at the top 300 genes, what percent of the seven are in here? Well, for the gray curve, the gray curve is this one right here. So this is the gray curve. Maybe I should have actually used a nice gray pen for my gray curve. So my gray curve is this one right here. And you can see that for the seven genes, it's basically listed within the top 100. So somewhere within the top 100, we actually find all seven genes. Within the top, you know, up to about here, within maybe the top 40, we found, say, maybe around 85% of the genes using the gray method. So that means that if we wanted to find uh, these seven genes using the stable persistence method, then we would have, if we wanted to find 85% of them, uh, six out of seven, then we would want to check, do biology experiments 
on, say, the top 40 genes ranked by this method. To find all seven, we have to go a little bit further. But it does give you a ranked order to say which ones are most likely periodic. Oh, these are, so we'll do the experiments on these first to confirm. These over here, you know, after 300, we don't want to check those. So depending upon how patient the biologists are, maybe they'll do 100 experiments, maybe they'll only do 40, um, maybe they'll only want to do 10, who knows. But it gives you a ranked order as to which ones you should check that would be most likely periodic and most likely involved in the somite development. If we then take a look at the 27 genes, well, with the 27 genes, uh, we now get all the way here with going up to 90%. So in the paper, they said 90%. I'm not guessing that. Everything else I'm guessing. But if I, don't, if I write it down, it's because it was in the paper. So they found 90% within the top 300 genes. And they got close to that earlier on. And so that's, you know, the gray method we can see here still worked quite well in identifying these genes that were previously identified. Questions on this slide? On the last slide, well, these methods do find additional genes. So we do find more potential genes that might be periodic with the same two-hour period. Let's take a look at the uh, graph on the right first. So they ranked the top 300 genes. So we ranked the top 300 genes using the L method. Remember, it's the S method that we like. That is our stable persistence. And so if the biologists were willing to carry out 300 experiments, they can choose to carry out the 300 uh, experiments found using stable persistence or the three methods using the L method, which is sort of a modified Fourier analysis method, or one of these other methods. If you take the union of these, they do have things in common. So for example, if I take a look at uh, S and L, they have 135 in common. So if they're top 300, they have 135 in common. But if I wanted to let, take a look at all of them, I'd be taking a look at 884 genes. So 884 genes were found using one of these five methods. That's a bit much to check out. But you can take a look at the intersection of the methods if you like. But they might have different, you know, the stable persistence didn't really find this one. So maybe you don't want to throw some of these things out. Um, if you look at what's in common with all five, there's 21 genes that are common with all five. So those should definitely be checked. What else should be checked? Maybe you want to do the top 50 and all of them. I'm, I, they didn't give the graph for that, so I don't know what the intersection is for that. We can take a look to see what is common among, I think this is, gray, yellow, and orange, so, so gray, yellow, and orange. So this would be 58 are in the intersection of the L, P, and S method. And then you can take a look at what's in the intersection of four of them, etc. So that's what this thing tells us is what is common to the five methods or what is the union of the five methods. On the left side over here, what we have is the genes for the stable persistence. That is the top half. So all of these genes, if you add up the numbers, 0 plus 15 plus 20, you know, all these numbers on the top half, you will get 300. If I take a look at the L method, so in terms of the L method, I need a yellow color. The yellow color is this. And so that would be this thing here. So if you want to see what's in the intersection between yellow and gray, that would be this right here. So if we add up these numbers right here, that should equal to the 135, uh, the intersection of S and L. And similarly, we can you know, go with a purple color 
and take a look at what's over in here and take a look at the various different intersections. So that's another way using Venn diagrams uh, to illustrate. So that's basically one method for using persistent homology. There are many other methods. You can see that no method is likely perfect, uh, but it does give biologists an idea as to which genes they should test that might be associated with somite development. Any additional questions? Thank you.